Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka, and we are recording this podcast on September the 21st, 2020. With fall approaching and winter just around the corner, many are wondering how the COVID-19 pandemic will affect flu season. In fact, some experts are even warning of a twindemic with the overlapping of the ongoing pandemic and the onset of influenza in the Northern Hemisphere. Well, here to discuss this with us today is one of our favorite experts, Dr. Greg Poland, virologist and infectious disease expert at the Mayo Clinic. Welcome, Dr. Poland. Tell me about this twindemic. How concerned are you about a twindemic and why is it important to have a flu vaccination this year? Yeah, well, twindemic is a is a term I coined some months ago and it got kind of picked up. And it's, it's really the confluence, as you very well said, of layering in the context of this COVID pandemic and influenza epidemic. You know, we have to realize that both viruses are spread essentially the same way. So where we have COVID spreading, we will very likely have influenza spreading because they're spread in the same way. And, and generally speaking, through the same avenues. Now, the concern about this is, is several fold. One is diagnostic confusion. The symptoms of COVID and influenza overlap almost exactly in their initial manifestations with the exception of the loss of smell, loss of taste. That would be very unusual in influenza. So uh, clinicians are gonna have to remember, they may, they're gonna have to test for both during our influenza season. And the reason for that relates to now the treatment side of things. There are a a growing set of treatments for COVID, but there are licensed, very effective antiviral treatments for influenza. So if we knew somebody had influenza, we would of course treat them. The third thing will be sort of the, the surge demand on the medical system. We've seen that in some of our big cities, haven't we? Just with COVID uh, in, in the uh, March and April, May timeframe. Imagine adding an epidemic on, on, on top of that. And finally, from the uh, pathology point of view, you know, you have, a, you have a respiratory virus that's essentially infecting the same organ, the lung and causing complications. So for all of those reasons, we are pushing very hard, pleading with people to follow what has been a CDC recommendation since February of 2010. And that is that every American age six months and older get a flu vaccine. For people that are age 65 and older, just a reminder that there are two highly effective flu vaccines meant specifically for older persons. So this is a, this is a really important message to, to get out. And I can see why this would be so confusing. I mean, just with the onset of even upper respiratory infections or what we call a classic cold, yes. mind, these three things may be very difficult to distinguish. Absolutely. Greg, when do you recommend that uh, people in the United States get their flu vaccines? I'm very much an adherent in this case of the CDC recommendations, which says that uh, all influenza uh, immunization programs should ideally conclude by the end of October. So the question has really been, is there a time frame in which it's too early to get the flu vaccine? We don't have great data, but particularly in older people where antibody levels don't start out as high, I would say that in general, from mid-September, so you know, basically the time frame we're in now, um, ideally through the end of October. However, since most of our influenza outbreaks don't peak until the February, March time frame, we give flu vaccine all the way through winter and into early spring, because you never know when you'll come across a case uh, just in your daily life. Now, you've made me a little bit curious because I have always assumed that we get the flu vaccine whenever it's ready here. However, um, are there differences when you should get it in the U.S., different parts of North America or even other parts of the world? Not so much in North America. That recommendation would would be the same. But your point about the Southern Hemisphere is is a very good one. Of course, our winter seasons are just the opposite. So they're coming out of uh, they're coming into spring and into their summer 
as we go into our fall and winter. Now there's been a very interesting observation, first time it's been observed in modern human history. In those locales and countries that had high compliance to mask wearing, physical distancing, hand sanitizing, they saw virtually no influenza. I mean, this is remarkable and has never been seen before. So an opportunity we have in the context of this twindemic is not only to get our flu vaccines, but to remember these non-pharmaceutical interventions, the mask wearing, um, hand washing, physical distancing, while they prevent COVID, they also decrease the risk of influenza. So we have a real opportunity here if we can get people to be compliant. And as you and I know, that's, that's been a hard thing in our culture. But what a great reminder that we really can make a difference with just very simple um, tactics that will allow us to avoid the use of medical care and, and to be ill this winter, Absolutely. which nobody enjoys. Yeah. Greg, how long does the flu vaccine last once we receive it? There's a lot of research still happening in that area. It's kind of an issue of what do we mean by last? In other words, by summertime, influenza has pretty much faded away, so people aren't exposed to it. The only thing we could do would be measure antibody levels, not whether they actually got the disease. But what we can say is that in your, when you're older, as you get over age 65, if you have a variety of medical conditions that decrease your immunity, your antibody doesn't start out as high after the flu vaccine, so it very likely wanes down faster. And that's why this recommendation of, you know, get these done in the September, October, even into November plus timeframe, and that will carry you through when the peaks of influenza are in the U.S. I had a discussion this uh, weekend with my husband, who is also a physician, about um, whether we should be wearing masks uh, or, or goggles or face shields in addition to wearing a mask. Um, I had, we had always understood that you, the droplets are what we're trying to prevent uh, giving and receiving by wearing a mask, but there is evidence about eye transmission as well. Is that true? And what yeah. would your recommendations be in that regard? Nina, you're always right on top of it. As a matter of fact, just uh, Friday or this weekend, um, CDC released some information agreeing with what many of us have been saying from the beginning, that this virus can be transmitted not only by large droplets, but by the aerosol and smaller particle route. So, uh, in fact, last week there was an article, now it's an association, but showing that people who regularly wore eyeglasses actually had a decreased risk in association with a mask of acquiring COVID. Well, we know this on the medical side. Now, we're, we're in higher risk situations, but we wear a mask and a face shield or eye goggles for that very reason. Well, the most important thing is a mask. No question about it. Hand sanitization, mask, and physical distancing is absolutely the best thing to do. Now, what if you're gonna go into an airplane, a store, a crowded area? I think wearing a face shield is another layer of protection. And we notice that people are getting that message and starting to do that. Uh, I think that's even a little more foreign or odd for people to do so they're not quite used to it. But if you said to me, what's the best protection? I would say a mask and a face shield. So I hear you primarily saying that we'd be wearing the face shield and the, uh, or the goggles to um, uh, alleviate some of our risk of uh, receiving COVID-19 or becoming right. infected with it. What about, is it possible for a COVID-19 patient to touch their eye and then to transmit it from their eye to someone else? Similar to coughing into your hand and then you know, shaking somebody's uh, hand, you can, you can certainly spread virus that way. So what we're trying to do with, with eyeglasses or goggles or a face shield is prevent those droplets from hitting our eye, our nose, our mouth, and, and getting infected. So what is the latest that we know about um, reinfection with COVID-19? Are people getting it a second time? Has that been proven yet? 
what we have are a handful or two of documented cases. And I think we have to take that as sort of the tip of the iceberg. Let me explain what I mean. In, in the very first, and I thought very well documented case of this young man in, in Hong Kong, he had symptoms, got tested by PCR, proven to have COVID, resolved those symptoms, got better. Months later, got tested again. It was positive. Now, he was asymptomatic, but it was positive. They happened to keep the first swab and the second swab. <clears throat> sequenced those two viruses and showed that they were both SARS-CoV-2, but slightly different from one another. And now there have been, as I say, a handful or two of these very well-documented cases showing that people get reinfected. Now, what they have been, for the most part, is very mild or asymptomatic. What we don't know is, well, what happens not a few months, but a year from now? Will they be equally susceptible? And this is an area of great research. We know with SARS-CoV-1, we know with seasonal coronaviruses in particular, that immunity can last as short as 80 days and as long as, as multiple years. So one important ramification of that is, might that be true with vaccines? We don't know. Another important ramification is when people let's say get tested and they're antibody positive or they had the PCR swab and they knew that they were positive. They should not presume that I'm home free. I can do anything that I want to. They absolutely are at risk of getting reinfected. And even if they don't have symptoms of potentially transmitting that to somebody else, even though they're not sick. So this is, this is an active area of inquiry. It has, uh, as I say, uh, huge ramifications for how we uh, think about this pandemic, how we treat it, how we evaluate our vaccines, and how we get across to people this message, there's no such thing as an immunity passport. Is it possible that the vaccine that we will be looking at for COVID-19 will be one that will need to be repeated, sort of like we do with a flu vaccine? My guess is the answer to that will turn out to be yes, for one very good reason and one potential reason. The good reason is we already know, even with symptomatic infection, where you see the whole virus and produce an immune response to it, that people are getting reinfected. The other potential reason is that this is an RNA virus, and RNA viruses inherently change. They mutate. They have subtle changes. We've seen that with some of these uh, persons who have gotten reinfected. I suspect that will be true with the vaccine uh, and that we'll have to give periodic booster doses. How often? No one knows because not enough time has elapsed, but uh, that's an area of research for the future. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic virologist and infectious disease expert, Dr. Greg Poland. I hope you learned something today. I know I did and we wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.